Okay, so now we're going to talk about something really important that develops here in the 1700s known as mesmerism. And it's named after a person named Mesmer, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but what's important here is what happens in Europe is the discovery of a couple of very important things with huge implications for understanding the nature of spiritual experience and, and fundamentally, you know, understand what religion is all about. Uh, and that is the rise of a concept of energy. They didn't call it energy at that point. They're going to call it animal magnetism is the term that gets used here in this period. And also is it's is the discovery of the role of the subconscious mind in terms of hypnosis and hypnotic suggestion and going into a trance state and these sorts of things. So there's going to be a lot that will come out of this. Now, just as a little bit of uh, what intro to this, you know, Obviously, in the East, over in China, they're very well versed uh, for centuries on working with energy. You know, they call it qi energy, and that there's energy in the body, energy in the environment, and that uh, having a healthy flow and balance of energy is so important for health. And if there's a, a poor health, it's because there's some kind of an imbalance of energy or a blockage of energy in the body, right? That's all quite well developed over in the East. But in the West here, this is something that had become totally forgotten and lost. There seems to be some indication that the ancient Egyptians uh, had um, some um, practices of healing people through touch and through the use of words. Okay, through the use of words. And we also have a history of here and there people healing through touch. We see that, for example, in Jesus, you know, healing people, and often it was through touch or they touched him or something like that, and they'd be healed. Also, being healed through the spoken word, giving command, like rise up and walk and be healed, and these sorts of things. Okay, so we have those sorts of healings happening through touch and through the power of word. And, uh, and also, uh, quite a lot of stories here of, um, oh, I could go on here, a Greek king um, way back in the 200 BC, uh, if you would touch his big toe, you would be healed. A Roman emperor, Vespasian, 79, who died in 79 CE, and then other Roman emperors, if you would touch them somehow, you could be healed. Uh, English, uh, in England, the King Edward, uh, in France, uh, King Philip I, uh, the same thing, you know, could be touched through healing. Uh, King Charles II, you know, was known as the Royal Touch, claimed to have cured thousands of people, you know, if they would touch him. So you have some of these things of somehow through touch, a healing could take place, all right? And then also we have developing at this time is an exploration of the use of magnets in heat, terms of healing, okay? That magnets and, and working with magnets can bring about healing. And so there was a bit of a tradition of this. And so an astronomer priest who was the director of the Imperial Observatory in Vienna in the 1700s, uh, Father Maximilian Hell, uh, he was intrigued by this idea that perhaps magnets could heal. And because he was there at the uh, Imperial Observatory as an astronomer, he had access to these really huge magnets. And he had, uh, oh, I don't think it was arthritis or rheumatism, and, the, and he experimented with, you know, these magnets going up and down his body with these magnets, and he claimed that he could heal himself from this. And this is then where the figure of Mesmer comes into play, okay, because he had contact with him. And Franz Anton Mesmer, uh, he lived here in the 1700s, as you can see the date, 1733 to 1815. And he did his uh, doctoral dissertation as a medical doctor on the influence of planets on the human body. And he was convinced from astrology that the planets definitely have influence on this planet as a whole, on life on it as a whole, and also on the human body. And so in his dissertation, he was exploring that there must be something something that gets transmitted from the planets to earth on the body something that is that gets transmitted right and that could connect it some kind of a fluid and that perhaps it was magnetic in in nature right so this is where the magnetic thing comes in here because they're, they're basically exploring energy fields right various energy fields it would be you know a, a, you know uh, electromagnetic fields and what have you right so 
since it was some kind of a fluid or field, well, we call it field today, magnetic fluid, and it brings life. It has something to do with enhancing life or inhibiting life and influencing life. It's animated. It's alive. And that's where they, he came up with the term animal magnetism is what gets locked on here. Okay, that there is this kind of invisible fluid essence that can kind of connect all things that's magnetic in nature in some way and is like a life force, right? And the Chinese, they would call it chi, and India, they'd call it prana. Um, you know, different traditions would have different labels for it, but here in Europe, this is the term that gets worked with here. And so he uh, started to experiment based on this um, uh, doctor that I mentioned who worked at the observatory in Vienna, because Mesmer is from Vienna, <laughs> right? Um, he started to experiment with magnets and he became convinced and had a lot of success with this, healing people with magnets. So what he would do is he would take some magnetic shavings, like shave off a little bit of, a, you know, I don't know if it'd be iron filings, right? Mix it in water, have people drink it, and then go up and down their body with a magnet, right? This is sort of how it began. And, and, and things would happen in their bodies. Uh, you know, they might start shaking and convulsing a bit and things would be shifting. They'd be feeling, having different sensations. Uh, someone's going to a bit of an altered state. All kinds of things would start happening and they would be released from whatever issue they'd have. There'd be some kind of a breakthrough, a healing that would happen. Well, then he started to experiment in different ways. And he found that if he also brought his will, his intention, the focus of the mind, and also just use his hands, right? That he could also emit and influence some kind of an energy. I mean, I'm gonna call it energy here, over people in this way, that that also worked. Then he also created this um, contraption of this huge vat filled with water and these rods coming out that had been magnetized that people are attached to. <laughs> and he would go in a circle around them playing a harmonica, so bringing in sound frequency and sometimes tapping them with a wand and that, wow, they'd go into these convulsions and healings would happen for people, right? So there's a lot going on here. Now, he had a lot of success. People were getting healed. He was creating, you know, a bit of a, I don't know, a bit of a movement, a trend, whatever, getting a reputation. And he was involved in the upper class circles. So he had uh, married a very wealthy woman and uh, he was friends with Mozart at the time, the most famous musician Mozart, and was very much in those aristocratic circles, upper class circles, and got quite a reputation. And so in Vienna, um, the Empress of Vienna, had a favorite musician, this young woman who could sing beautifully to piano. And uh, she had been losing her eyesight, been going blind. And so she wondered if Mesmer would be able to do something for her because this is one of her favorite musicians. So she got Mesmer to come and, and to work with this woman. And she had been become totally blind, couldn't see. And uh, he worked with her and she started to see shadows and figures, you know, fuzzy, but eyesight was coming back to her. Well, when other doctors heard of this, uh, they demanded that uh, Mesmer face, um, uh, you know, investigation in terms of uh, what he was doing. So what was it? I've got it. Well, I think it's on the next slide here. Do I have it on the next slide? Um, yeah, that he was uh, brought before the German Medical Academy to demonstrate his method and his theory. All right. And I'm just going to go back here to this because I want to bring all this in a bit later. Um, he was called in to uh, demonstrate this in front of a committee of doctors and so-called scientists. And you got to remember, this is here now in the 1700s, you know, post-enlightenment, the enlightenment has really kicked off. This is a time period where there's more increasing suspicion about religion and magic as being superstitious and that science has the answer. And we get the beginnings of modern science, which has really ostracized anything that would be seen as being somewhat spooky, magical, spiritual, superstitious, and whatnot, right? And so they investigated this, and they conclude, well, there's no scientific evidence for this thing called animal magnetism. I mean, where does it ex exist? How can we measure this invisible fluid, this 
you know, what we would today would call energy. Uh, we can't see it, we can't touch it, we can't measure it. it, it's invisible, it doesn't even exist. And they condemned him as being a quack um, and very much humiliated him, right? And condemned what he was doing. And so that then led to his leaving Austria and Vienna uh, and going over to Paris and France. All right. Uh, so he makes this move after this sort of investigation that happens that condemns him as, be, as I say here, right? Scientists uh, dismissed it as quackery, that there's no evidence for this. Okay. Um, however, let me just see here. I see I, I can, I go and talk and yet I don't know what I've got in my slides here. Let me go back. No, that's forward. Back. Okay. So, yeah. Um, and so, yeah. So go, just go back here. Oh, I hate doing these slides. Um, with animal magnetism, his thesis that he developed is that there exists this invisible something they called animal magnetism. And he held that this was central for human health and that the cause of all illness was a result of an imbalance of this, what we would call today, I'm going to call it energy field. Okay. And and you could restore, if you restore this balance in both body and mind, because there's a connection between body and mind, uh, this is where he kind of followed through on what I mentioned earlier, Paracelsus, who held that the human mind, what you believe, plays a role in a lot of this stuff, can really influence what your body happens for your body for healing, right? Like the placebo effect, the mind, what you believe, what you think can have impact. So it's about the body and mind together that things can be brought back into balance, back into harmony, right? That that is the key to healing. And that is also why there's illness is when there's an imbalance. That was his main thesis. Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, he experimented with magnets. He experimented uh, with also just using his body, using the, the various contraptions. Um, he was, uh, he left uh, Austria and went to Paris, all right? And while he was there in Paris, similar thing. He, and here's just an example of uh, the huge um, vat that somehow I think it was filled with water with rods coming out and people would sit around it in a circle and, and they would be he healed and there'd be often convulsions and things. And let me just backtrack on this here because it's something people don't understand. In a lot of healing practices, it's very common for people to, what, you know, an observer would think they're becoming a little bit psychotic, but the body vibrating and shaking, right? And, and sometimes literally convulsing. Uh, it's a movement of energy going through the body that's doing that where things are getting unblocked and released and things are shifting in a powerful way. Right. You'll see this throughout history. Uh, you know, it's evident here, obviously. Uh, it came up in, if, you know, the Christian tradition and Protestant different groups. There were the Shakers and then the Quakers. <laughs> the Shakers over in England, I think, I forget now, in the 1600s. And then uh, shortly after that, it, over in the United States, the Quakers. They were Protestants who would so spiritually tune in to the divine presence to connect with God that would result in their shaking. Okay? And that's where they get the name of the Quakers and the Shakers. Uh, this is a common thing that happens. People who do body work, acupuncture, massage, this can happen when there's a release of trauma in the body. There'll be this shaking that goes on. Just, I just want to, again, put things in context. This shows up in a lot of ways, all right, in terms of powerful healing experiences or even powerful spiritual experiences where there's something profoundly shifting. This is a very common thing, right? But an outsider think, oh, my God, these people are crazy. Oh, you know, it's all of the devil or who knows what. <laughs> you know, there'll be this sort of reaction against it, right? So anyway, so this is what was happening for him. So he goes to Paris, and again, he attracts uh, a lot of the upper class people, the aristocrats around him. He gets a movement going. He starts teaching this to people, all right? And again, another commission is called, and I should mention here, uh, Queen Antoinette, uh, Marie Antoinette. She was very interested in this and got involved and dabbled a bit and, and therefore got attention of the king that, of course, then got various scientists to think we better investigate this. And so, again, in France, there was another committee uh, put together to investigate if there's any validity to what he did, if this is real science or mere quackery uh, and, and magical superstition. 
And Benjamin Franklin, at that time, he was the ambassador for the United States in France at this time. He was actually a part of this committee. And again, they concluded there's no evidence for such a thing as animal magnetism of this invisible fluid that can connect all life in some way and, and have such an influence on the body. And so again, he gets condemned uh, as a quack and he then leaves for England. And basically things fizzle out for him after that because shortly after there's the French Revolution and total mayhem breaks out okay, in France. However, he did teach this to many people, all right? And different people went in different directions with this, which is of extremely high importance here, right? A lot of things come out of this mesmerism. So here I want to highlight a few, okay? This is really important. Now, number one, there are those who focus on the physiological basis behind this. That A, number one, on a physical sense, right, in terms of with the body and healing, uh, what comes out of this is that magnets can play a role in healing physical ailments. And from this, uh, what will evolve out of this is magnetic healing as a partic particular healing technique. So even today, if you go into stores, some stores, you know, you can buy uh, magnetic bracelets, uh, magnetic insoles for your shoes, all right, uh, magnetic pellets to put in your bed to lay on, uh, that using magnets around the body can realign the energy field of the body and bring it more into coherence. That's always the key, bringing things into harmony, coherence, that brings healing. Because the cause of disease and illness is stress, decoherence. Things are in conflict, right? Okay. Uh, that's stress, and stress causes dis-ease. Huh? And that's what illness, how uh, illness develops. So that's one form, is magnetic healing, right? Where it's just focusing on the role of magnets to heal the body. The second thing at this level of the physiological healing level, right, is the healing effect of energy and various forms of energy healing, right? That the body, you know, I emit an energy field from my body and I can direct that energy field through my intention. And usually it can come out through, you know, the palm of your hand. And so you can do healing work on people like therapeutic touch. You know, just going over them with the healing energy, my energy field influencing the other person's energy field through touch. And from this, therapeutic touch is sort of the most simplest of all these, all kinds of healing, energy healing traditions have developed, all right? And it's going to lead into uh, energy medicine down the road. The Chinese have been doing this forever already, <laughs> you know, in terms of Qigong, all right? Various forms of qi, Qigong, uh, acupuncture and acupressure and all these things are working with the energy fields in the body and bringing about healing and working with that, okay? So that's just number one. This is all that will come out of this down the road. That's very important in terms of a lot of contemporary uh, spirituality, uh, even the practices, because uh, a lot of contemporary spirituality revolves around healing, healing the body, healing the mind, healing the spirit, the soul. It's going to be a key theme, okay, of spirituality today. Okay, so the second thing that comes out of this is more the psychology at work here, a psychological basis of mesmerism, what's going on here. Because some people, then, they found that when they mesmerize people, that some people start to go into a trance state, kind of like as though they'd fall asleep. And then as they're being under, kind of fallen asleep, different things can happen. They can then be programmed, right? They can be hypnotized. And you can then tell them, you will feel no pain when I poke this needle in your arm. When I put your hand in cold water, it's going to feel like it's hot water. Or, or whatever, you know, then you could program them and condition them and get them to experience what you've told them they should be experiencing. And it becomes real to them, right? And, uh, and so here we get the development of hypnosis. And people are going to start using this, uh, specifically in dentistry. They're going to pull your tooth out. That's usually a very painful thing to pull somebody's tooth out, all right? And as mere agony, you've got to strap them down on the table because of the pain. But they would then, through hypnosis, 
uh, program their subconscious mind that they will feel no pain when the tooth comes out. Instead, it, you know, tell them it will feel pleasurable. I don't know what they do, but something like that. And they started doing this where they would use hypnosis, all right? They would mesmerize patients uh, because they wouldn't have any kind of uh, anesthetic to, to deal with pain or whatever to relieve that pain or to put them out. They would use hypnosis. And so this got developed, okay? And from this, people discover that, oh, we have a subconscious mind that we can reprogram in various ways to change people's behaviors uh, and tendencies in life, okay? So hypnosis all develops out of this. The second thing that comes out of this, <coughs> rooted in psychology or based on a psychological uh, element, excuse me, <coughs> is recognizing the power of belief, the power of thought, mind, belief over matter. Now, what you believe is what will happen, is what you will experience, is what will come true. Okay. And so this is where the placebo effect is the classic example. You know, the sugar pill. You tell the person, this is a new medicine that we're experimenting. It's really hopeful that this could really work and cure you of this disease. You just take one every day, all right? And, and we're going to see, if, and we're hoping that this will cure you, right? And it's the power of belief that, yes, if I take this, it's going to heal me, right? That's a, yeah, the classic thing of the placebo effect. It's a power of belief over matter, over the body. And that is something that's going to lead to the birthing of a whole movement called the new thought movement, the power of mind over matter. If you believe it, if you can see it and visualize it, if you put out that intention to the universe of what you want, it will happen. Okay, it will materialize, it will become real. And that's going to lead to the law of attraction. Uh, the secret becomes a very popular film and all kinds of teachings around this. Okay? Very, very important. Okay, so that's in, under psychology here, the second thing, but altogether these are four things. Okay, now. The third aspect where mesmerism has a lot of impact, okay, down the road here is the uh, emphasis on the paranormal phenomena that's associated with it. So what happens here is some people, when they go into a trance state, oh, they develop the psychic powers. It's like they know things that they shouldn't know. So you put someone, you mesmerize them, and they go into a bit of a trance, and then all of a sudden they tell you, oh, the keys that you lost yesterday, they're actually under the bed next to your shoes. And you think, hey, I, how did you know that I lost my keys yesterday? And then you would go home and you'd find those keys under the bed there by your shoes, just like this person that you just mesmerized told you. How did they know that? Were they able to read your mind? How can they see things, right? So sometimes people, would they'd all of a sudden, they'd speak about, oh, your past. They'd know things about you that they shouldn't know. Or they'd tell you things about the future. Or they'd be able to tell you that, oh, you know, your stomach problem is actually because you're eating too much, I don't know, eggs. And you're allergic to eggs, eggs and you need to stop eating eggs and your stomach problem will all go away. It's like, really? Oh, how do you know? So they, someone's in a trance state, they would give a diagnosis of an illness and prescribe a healing, uh, tell you things that there's no way they could know. It's like, wow, They're, they've got these psychic powers, these psychic abilities, okay? And so what's gonna come out of that is an interest in this sort of stuff and the rise of parapsychology. Uh, and various societies are going to get established to investigate the validity and try to scientifically research paranormal phenomena. How can we see things, know things uh, beyond space and time, right? Uh, this is what people are going to explore and this is what's going to kick off in the early 1800s. Are different societies committed to uh, parapsychological research, okay? Right? So that's one thing that's going to kick off. The other thing that's going to kick off from this paranormal phenomena aspect is that when some people go into trance, it's like, oh, I see your dead grandmother. Her name is Rosa. I see her with her bun on the head, her head, uh, wearing a red apron and, red apron, and she loved baking apple pies, you know. And oh, it's so bad. She just died of a heart attack three years ago. 
And you think, what? How did you know? This is my dead grandmother, Rosa. Yes, you know, she loved making apple pies and she died of a heart attack, yada, yada. And so what happens here is people start being able to talk to the dead, spirits of the dead. And this is going to kick off as well a whole new movement known as spiritualism. Okay, spiritualism, where mediums are able to go into trance state and be able to communicate with beings on the other side, right? And that's going to kick off a whole new religious movement of spiritualism, all right? So this is some important stuff that comes out of mesmerism, uh, a lot of important things that come out of mesmerism that is going to be quite revolutionary. And people are going to be fascinated with these things. It's like, wow, this is really cool, amazing stuff. How is it that this could happen? Uh, oh, you know, how is this possible? Because again, mainstream religion at this time, in terms of Christianity, didn't even talk about this stuff. It's like, it just like didn't even exist. And then mainstream science that's developing at this point would have nothing to do with all this sort of thing. It was always dismissed as mere superstition or magic of old times when people had no understanding of science and it all got dismissed. And yet, in terms of human experience, people are like, no, 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 no. There's more to reality. There's more to the self. You know, there's more to things here in terms of how it all works than what's just given to us always in terms of mainstream religion and mainstream science, okay? Uh, there's gonna be people on a quest for understanding what this all implies, okay? So, so what happens next here is this mesmerism comes to America. Okay, uh, and again, okay, Mesmer died 1815. Uh, we have the French Revolution in 1789, a lot of things going on in Europe. People had been taught, you know, these things. And so in the 1830s, we have some people coming over to America to bring mesmerism, okay, uh, along the Eastern seaboard there, the Atlantic seaboard. And what happens is, Again, this is a time period where there's no TV, there's no radio. Uh, there would be these lecture halls and people would come in and give lectures. This was the thing to do as far as anything interesting in a lot of cities, right? People would go and hear some presentation, a lecture given uh, in the local lecture hall. And so this is what they did. They would come to the lecture hall and they'd have the audience there. They would bring some people up on stage and mesmerize them, hypnotize them, and all kinds of amazing things would happen. And people were just... It, it, it just went like crazy. They were amazed by this and fascinated by the different things that could happen. People going to trance and coming up with information they couldn't know, give diagnosis of illnesses that there's no way they could know. Uh, once in a while talking to somebody who's dead, um, all kinds of bizarre things would happen. And it created quite a movement and ruckus, okay? And so then people started to publish little pamphlets booklets on how to do it, <laughs> you know, how to mesmerize people, right? And so people started to form circles where they would experiment with each other. And so as I say here, in 1843, it was estimated there were around 200 mesmerists practicing just in the city of Boston alone, right? And all kinds of interesting things would happen. And so here, a lot of um, you know, again, influential people like city mayors, governors, uh, you know, supervisor of the school system, of this and that, you know, a lot of big names would kind of get involved. And they would try to say, listen, we've got to get some scientists together. We've got to just, you know, investigate some of these things. And so they would form circles. And they would uh, try to, you know, determine if there's some kind of, uh, uh, you know, fakery kind of stuff going on here. So they would take, for example, uh, a woman through some accident who's totally blind. Okay, she's just totally blind. And uh, they would then, ahead of time, write letters and put in, you know, information statements in a letter and have it in a sealed envelope so you can't see anything in it, right? Give it to her to say, okay, what does this envelope say? Okay, what's inside this envelope? What, what are the words in there, right? What's the statement written? And she would come up with this stuff. It's like, this is impossible. A, she's blind. A, it's in a sealed envelope. There's no way she could know this, okay? Uh, then they'd take, you know, they'd hide objects uh, in different places in the house before she would come. And uh, again, they'd ask her, where is this? Where is that? And she'd tell them where it is, you know? So they would kind of do these sorts of um, 
tests on people experimenting like this and we're just blown away and of course this is what really fueled then uh, uh, people to get into the study of this paranormal phenomenon and this is when William James William James lived at this time period and he's often regarded as the father of modern psychology and he was involved in some of this stuff he was a, a member of one of these parapsychological associations and held that there is something to all of this and uh, yeah anyways just to let you know there's there's a lot involved here okay now I think that's all I'm going to do at this point and I'll talk about spiritualism next time okay all right hopefully this all made some sense but this is really important stuff okay ciao